thank you, everyone, for uh, letting us have that uh, few, few minute break. Um, I'm actually going to ask uh, Dr. Wharton to speak up, and then um, we'll go back to Dr. Oliver. Uh, so th thank you. Um, again, we appreciate hearing from the committee about the um, about the strength of your desire for this to be a preferential recommendation. Um, it this is this is the language we have used in the past for preferential recommendations, and um, I would like to just echo the point that was made earlier. We have ACIP makes recommendations. We don't make strong recommendations and weak recommendations, we make rep recommendations. And this is a preferential recommendation. We have heard your comments. They will be incorporated in our communications and our guidance and our implementation for this. And um, so, I, you know, we, we need the language, we need to have vote language that is consistent with other ACIP vote language. Thank you, Dr. Warden. I'm going to ask for a motion for the vote on the table here. Dr. Peeling. Yes, this is Kathy Peeling. I'd like to make a motion to accept the recommendation as worded. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a second? Dr. Bell. I second the motion. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt the recommendation language presented by the work group. Um, are there any additional questions or clarifications needed? I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to assume the committee has no objections to proceeding with a vote. Um, so ACIP members, please remember to turn on your video. I'm going to ask everybody to state your name, uh, whether you have a conflict of interest, and then your vote. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Oliver Brooks. Dr. Oliver Brooks, I have no conflicts, and I vote yes. Thank you. Dr. Bell. Beth Bell, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Ms. Bata. Lynn Bata, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Alt. Alt, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Talbot. I'm still thinking. Can I continue okay. come back to me? Thank yep. you. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, no conflict, um, yes. Dr. Paling. Paling, no conflicts, yes. Ms. McNally. McNally, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Long. Dr. Long. I'm so sorry, uh, my, my mistake. Long, no conflict, yes. You could read my lips, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Lee, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Lair. Jamie Lair, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump to Dr. Daly. Uh, Daly, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Cotton. Cotton, no conflict, yes. Um, Dr. Seneas. Seneas, no conflict, yes. I'm sorry, my video does not seem to be working. Thank you. No conflict. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chen. Uh, Chen, let me just again say for the uh, the perception of conflict that my employer, the University of Maryland, Baltimore, has a grant from the Emergent uh, Biosolutions that uh, supports work that I do on developing a Shigella vaccine. I believe this presents no real conflict of interest. My vote is yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Talbot. Talbot, no conflicts, yes. Thank you, okay. We have 15 yeses, zero noes. The ACIP vote as, uh, passes as listed here. I want to thank everybody for um, your patience and <laughs> your um, being so gracious about uh, getting through that vote. Um, and I will um, also uh, make sure, and I just wanted to state out loud, I know Dr. Oliver and her team 
will absolutely convey the strength um, of the recommendation uh, from the perspective of the ACIP members uh, to make sure that uh, it is reflected in the clinical considerations and I hope also the communications to the public. Uh, Ms. Bata. Thank you. Um, this is in response to educational material and the language in the EUA where we're providing um, a risk assessment of one per 100,000 um, doses administered. And um, I think that the bigger issue is the, the consequence of this event, uh, because we do see a higher frequency of myocarditis, and yet we are preferring the mRNA over um, the, the Janssen vaccine. And so I think it's really important to um, include the, the severity um, of the the side effect that um, is a driving factor for this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pata. Dr. Chen? Yeah, I, um, I, I really want to appreciate how the, uh, our CDC colleagues have really been working behind the scenes and providing these much more precise estimates of the rates and looking at the risks and those sorts of things. I, I think it, it's nice confirmation that it looks to me, similar to the AZ experience, um, there, there were no real surprises to me, in my opinion. Um, I think we continue to grapple with that this is a serious disease that has that 15% fatality, and that sounds scary. Even though these are small numbers, this is a rare event. Um, so I, I'm happy with us kind of wrangling over this preference, and I'm, I'm glad that we kind of tackled this uh, together and, and uh, were able to come to a unanimous vote, which, which was uh, very nice. Uh, I think the only suggestion, and, and maybe we'll get into this as we talk about the specific recommendations again, and we've talked about having the, uh, the clinical consideration section be crystal clear. The only thing I, I might add and uh, is just from my own experience with you know, yellow fever vaccine, which I deal with on a daily basis in my uh, travel clinic, is that that has a, a serious but very rare adverse event, uh, which is the, the predilection for neurotropic or dysrotropic disease, which can be fatal as well, and it uh, happens in older adults. And so there's some really nice language that's in the recommendations in the precautions section because there is no other alternative uh, for yellow fever vaccine. So if you want to travel to a yellow fever area and, you know, you want to get vaccinated, you need to be very clear about this clear, you know, the precaution for this risk. Here we have um, an option for mRNA-based vaccines. Great. But I, I like the language there, so I guess I'm just asking for the CDC colleagues to look at that uh, precautions language that's in the yellow fever recommendations. And, and it, I think it really communicates that risk very clearly. I think we need to communicate again that there's this higher risk among women of a certain age group, 30 to 49 years of age. Uh, it doesn't disappear, you know, in other age groups, but again, that's where kind of we see the highest risk. And so um, I just might just mention that again, because that might be a, a helpful way for us to communicate to the public, because ultimately we need to communicate these, these risks appropriately and in the proper context. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Dr. Paling. I wanted to take a moment to say thank you. I want to say thank you to the VAST team, to the CDC team, to FDA, and the many people behind them that are working so hard to identify both the benefits and the risk of all these vaccines. I believe today's meeting demonstrates the benefit and the strength of all the work that is being done and really appreciate um, coming together and sharing this discussion and um, openly and transparently. Um, I think it's um, very, uh, it's precedent. Uh, it's quite interesting that this comes in the week that we covered past 800,000 lives. And vaccines are, um, COVID-19 is now a vaccine preventable death for the vast majority of persons. And so I hope as people look at this discussion today, they recognize the strength of the vaccine recommendation and the encouragement that all persons who are eligible for vaccines receive a vaccine. 
all who are eligible for a booster get them and to follow um, the other precautions of using masks and, um, and um, wash in safe distance because um, we're about to enter the holidays and it's really important and Omicron is coming. And so I hope all takes this and I wanna say thank you to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Yeah, I'd like to make a couple of overarching comments and, and they, they follow along well with Dr. What, what Dr. Paling just said. So, you know, I think I, I wanna remind everybody that this is <clears throat> in part a reflection of the strength of our vaccine safety surveillance system. <clears throat> and just remind everyone that surveillance, safety surveillance continues daily and that includes surveillance of all vaccine platforms and that includes surveillance of booster doses. Um, I also want to say that I appreciate the transparency of this process. Um, you know, this was new data that was immediately brought to VAST and then immediately brought to the work group and then, and then the ACIP was convened. So I really appreciate the transparency. Um, I'll reiterate a point that we've made in the past that these recommendations are interim and that if the circumstances change, then we'll, we'll revisit those circumstances. That could be with respect to effectiveness or durability of immune response or the effectiveness against variants or with respect to safety. So um, you have our commitment there. And then, you know, we make vaccine recommendations for the U.S., but I just want to put this a little bit in the, in the global context and just remind everybody that, you know, there may be settings where there's just a single vaccine available. And as we said last spring when vaccines were in scarce supply, the best COVID vaccine you can get is the one you can get today. So that would apply here in the global circumstance if there is you know, only one vaccine available and that vaccine is a Janssen vaccine, then the benefits of vaccinating at that moment in time strongly outweigh the risks. Over. Thank you, Ms. McNally. Thank you. I, I do want to echo Dr. Daly's sentiments regarding the strength of our safety monitoring system and the action based on that data. The monitoring, however, is one side of it, and communication to the public is an important piece in this. And I think the better patient education we can have around this issue and other issues is only going to prove very beneficial for us in vaccine confidence. So I wanna make sure that we continue to be focused on this effort and that everyone is focused on the fact that it is a shared responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Okay. Um, I just, you know, want to highlight that um, the scientific deliberation on this topic uh, was critical for the vote today, but um, what you just heard today about the vote language, and I really want to just th thank Dr. Talbot for, um, and Dr. Long and, uh, and Dr. Um, Sanchez for bringing these points to the forefront. I mean, it's not actually about the vote language in this instance. I think their underlying concern is one that we all share, which is it's more important how we communicate this to the public. So there is our vote language, which is focused on the scientific deliberation today, um, but that is not sufficient for what needs to get to the public. And I do think that um, there is a request, a strong request from committee members that the balance of benefits and risks and full transparency about the benefits and risks and the available vaccines that are out there is critical to what drove that decision today. What you heard today were clearly the priorities have, were vaccine safety um, and also access and equity. And those three things, I think, drove the decision, at least for me today. Um, and it doesn't in any way detract from the need for a strong language around the importance of all of those aspects in how we communicate this particular decision to the public. So um, I know that our CDC colleagues will work hard to ensure that they are going to um, uh, reflect that in the clinical considerations. I know we rely on uh, the public and the media to help us continue and in our provider communities and our public health communities to communicate uh, the importance of this information to the public. Um, and I will also just um, really highlight the points that were made earlier about um, it's not just um, equity and access to vaccines, it's equity and access to having in information, full information about those vaccines. And we continue to have a gap. And I think uh, this recommendation um, is highlighting the gaps that continue to exist. So, uh, again, it is a shared responsibility. Thank you, Ms. McNally. So um, I appreciate all of our committee's um, points and feedback. And what we'd like to do is move on to two updates, if everyone is ready to move forward, um, which is Dr. John Su will provide a COVID vaccine safety surveillance update in children 5 to 11 years of age. And then we'll end with uh, Dr. Heather Scobie and an update on the Omicron variant. So 
Dr. Sue, please go ahead. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, and just go ahead and go on from here. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Okay, just a little bit of data from VSafe. And next slide, please. So just as a reminder, VSafe is a voluntary CDC smartphone-based monitoring program. Next slide, please. And pretty much what happens is uh, participants receive a daily text message for the first week after vaccination. And then after that, uh, they receive text messages uh, on an increasing, um, or sorry, on a uh, more periodic basis, just to see what kind of health outcomes they've experienced. Next slide, please. So as of December 12th, there were 41,232 participants in VSAFE between the ages of five and 11 years. All of them had received dose one and 23,583 have had dose two of Pfizer's vaccine. Um, for context, 7.1 million doses have been administered to children of these ages across the United States. And the data on this slide just reflect that um, about roughly equal amounts of males and females, um, or that this population is roughly equal in male and female distribution, most of whom were of white, non-Hispanic race and ethnicity. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the reactions and health impacts reported by children um, during the first week after vaccination. On the x-axis, you can see the proportion by dose number on the blue bar being after dose one, and in the orange bar after dose two of those persons or participants reporting any injection sites or any systemic reaction or any health impact, which included one or more of the inability to perform daily activities, or to attend school or seeking medical care. And we can see generally there's a slightly greater proportion of participants reporting these outcomes after dose two relative to dose one. Also, very few, regardless of dose number, reported needing to seek medical care, roughly around 1%. And I'll add the bulk of those were for outpatient clinic visits. Next slide, please. This slide shows uh, the those participants reporting any systemic reaction during the week after vaccination on the x-axis by uh, days since vaccination uh, with the orange bar representing the proportion of participants reporting a positive response after dose one, the orange bar after dose two. So for example, um, for day zero or day of vaccination, um, that bar would represent the proportion of people reporting yes, they had experienced a systemic reaction that Day. And what we can see is that most people report during the first, uh, within the first day or two after vaccination, but then after that, uh, systemic reactions drop off uh, considerably. So most of the systemic reactions reported tended to be transient in nature. Next slide, please. This slide presents the top five solicited reactions the week after uh, vaccination. On the x-axis, we see they were pain, fever, fatigue, headache, and myalgia, all of which were observed during pre-authorization clinical trials. Um, these are presented by dose number um, with the proportions um, shown by severity in stacked bar form, where the severity is denoted by different colors, uh, green indicating that the symptom was noticeable but not problematic, the yellow representing severity of moderate intensity, limiting normal daily activities, and the gray bar is representing um, severity strong enough to make daily activities difficult or impossible. Fever was defined by a temperature where a mild fever is defined as 38 to 38.4 degrees Celsius, a moderate fever between 38.5 to 38.9 degrees Celsius, and a severe fever being 40 degrees Celsius or greater. And like the previous slide, we can see that most participants uh, tend to report slightly greater proportion, or sorry, greater, slightly greater proportion of uh, participants reported uh, these symptoms after dose two relative to dose one. Um, that being said, the uh, proportion within each dose reporting uh, severity tended to be uh, comparable between doses. Next slide, please. 
So some limitations of the vSafe data include that the vSafe population likely doesn't represent all the vaccinated U.S. population. It is a voluntary opt-in program, so we are dealing with a selected population that might have some reporting bias. In addition, uh, dose two or uh, data describing second dose uh, of Pfizer's vaccine is pretty limited at this time, but hopefully we can um, provide more data as uh, the data mature. Next slide, please. So um, just to briefly sum up, most reported reactions were mild to moderate in severity. Most uh, were reported uh, the day of vaccination, slightly more frequently after dose two, but transient in nature. For both dose one and dose two, missing school was infrequently reported and few, around 1%, reported seeking medical care. Again, mostly outpatient in nature. And the local and systemic reactions were reported with similar frequency as per clinical trials. Next slide, please. So just some data from VAERS. Next slide, please. Just a really quick reminder that VAERS is the nation's passive early warning system uh, for vaccine safety. Next slide, please. So as of December 10th, there were 3,233 reports uh, to VAERS among children ages 5 to 11 years after COVID-19 vaccination. That's in the context of 7.1 million doses administered, where 5.1 million of that was of dose 1 and 2 million were of dose 2. Median age was nine years with a roughly even distribution uh, between males and females. On the chart to the right, you can see by, by age of reported child, the uh, counts of uh, reports, which do tend to increase by age, but within age, the distribution by sex represented by the red bar and the blue bar are comparable. Next slide, please. Over here, we present some race ethnicity data, and the take home here is that most children, most reported children with either white, non-Hispanic race or ethnicity, or those data were not reported. Next slide, please. Over here, we report uh, the time from uh, vaccination and symptom onset, and we can see by, on the x-axis, time to symptom onset in days, y-axis, uh, counts, and most reports uh, occurred either the day of vaccination or the day after. Next slide, please. This slide presents the most frequently reported adverse events among non-serious reports, of which there were 3,152, which represents better than 97% of reports among children in these ages. And we can see that uh, of these, most reflect either a vaccination error of some sort or symptoms that were observed during uh, preauthorization clinical trials, including fever, uh, headache, and fatigue. Um, I will add that um, when a vaccine uh, error was reported, frequently the report specified that no adverse event occurred as a result of that error. And so that would explain why uh, no adverse event is reported very frequently as well. Next slide, please. This slide shows the most frequently reported adverse events among serious reports, of which there were 81. And by serious, we mean fulfilling federal criteria such as hospitalization, prolongation of existing hospitalization, and the like. And we can see how um, a lot of these reflect potential myocarditis, such as elevated troponins or chest pain. And some might actually reflect potential multisystem inflammatory syndrome such as fever or C-reactive protein increased. Next slide, please. There were two reported deaths. Both are still under review, and they both involve children with complicated medical histories and were of frail health. One female was five years of age who had a history of twin-to-twin -twin transfusion, spastic cerebral palsy as well. And um, she was admitted to PICU because of respiratory failure um, due to infection with rhinovirus and mycoplasma. She was stabilized and transferred to the floor and because of her history was observed overnight after vaccination and was found to have an uneventful evening. She was discharged home and the night prior to uh, death, she was at her baseline state of health, but the following morning was found pulseless and not breathing and unfortunately they were unable to resuscitate her. 
The other child's a female six years of age who suffered a near drowning incident, which uh, led to severe hypoxic encephalopathy, including spastic cerebral palsy, as well as dysautonomia. The extent of that dysautonomia was such that you know, the pain from a distended bladder would be enough to uh, affect her, uh, her vital signs. So um, she was vaccinated without issue, and 10 days afterwards, then developed fever and lactic acidosis, and shortly thereafter experienced uh, progressive weakness with flaccid paralysis and loss of her gag reflex. Notably, with past stressors, those particular functions remain preserved. So this was new for her. And unfortunately, she continued to decompensate, ultimately experiencing respiratory failure and hypotension. She ultimately died, and my understanding is that autopsy didn't really reveal much. So again, this was a death in a child who had a very complicated medical history and, again, was a very frail health. Next slide, please. We did have 10 reports of myocarditis. Uh, again, this is in the context of 7.1 million doses administered. Of the 3,233 reports, uh, 14 were of myocarditis. Of those, five we're still trying to get follow-up information on. For nine, we were able to obtain follow-up information, allowing us to determine that eight met the CDC working case definition for myocarditis, and one remains under review. Of the eight reports that met case definition, four were male, four were female, and uh, six were after dose two, two were after dose one. Next slide, please. So here we provide some details for the eight reports that we were able to confirm that case definition. It's very data dense, but I think really the take home here is that the clinical picture looks very much like the presentations we see in older children. Um, and what we do know is that of these eight, we have outcomes for six of them. And for five of those six, the patient's symptoms resolved at time of report. And the last one was recovering at time of report, but that was a couple of months ago. So it seems that for many of these, the uh, symptoms seem to be pretty mild. I'll also add that one of these children had a fairly long onset. You can see that onset ranged from you know, zero to four days, but one was almost two weeks. And this patient actually had headache and gastrointestinal systems three to four days before presenting with chest pain and may actually uh, represent viral myocarditis. Next slide, please. And just brief mention about some data from the vaccine safety data link. Next slide, please. Just a reminder that VSD is a organization, a collaboration of healthcare organizations across the United States. Next slide, please. And these organizations share data, including immunization records, outpatient visits, vital statistics, and other data, all linked by study IDs providing a very robust means of identifying people with potential adverse events of interest, which can then be followed up by chart review or electronic health record review to get a good, really good idea of what happened to that particular person. Next slide, please. So because of that robust organization, VSD is able to perform near real-time monitoring as data become available. And on the right side of the slide, we see some of the conditions that VSD is actively monitoring, including myocarditis. As of December 14th, there were 333,000 doses administered to children 5 to 11 years of age, 226,000 were of dose 1, 107,000 of dose 2, and there were no, no confirmed reports of myocarditis in either the 0 to 7 or 0 to 21 day risk windows. Next slide, please. And I'll just briefly add that the VSD program is very early in monitoring, and we will be uh, keeping a watch on data as they evolve. So just to briefly sum up, during November 2nd through December 10th, or actually 12th in the case of VSAFE, um, VARES had received 3,233 reports among children ages 5 to 11 years. 7.1 million doses of the vaccine had been administered as of December 9th. Median age was nine years. Most children were of non-Hispanic white uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, median time to onset was day of vaccination. Most reports were non-serious, but there were two reports of death in children with complicated medical histories. There were eight reports meeting the case definition for myocarditis, but the clinical course appeared mild. Next slide, please. 
Most common adverse events uh, reflected vaccination errors or symptoms observed in preauthorization and clinical trials. Um, between vSafe and VAERS, the reported rates and ethnicity was comparable. And just to add a few details about vSafe's data, most reactions following dose two were slightly more frequent. Most reactions were mild to moderate in severity and transient in nature. Regardless of dose, uh, no more than 10% of children reported missing school and few, about 1%, reported seeking medical care. There have have been no reports of myocarditis in the 0 to 7 or 0 to 21 day risk windows and VSD to date. Next slide, please. So I appreciate the opportunity to share these data and if time allows, I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Are there any questions for Dr. Sue? Happy to take them from the members, uh, liaisons, anyone uh, who would wish to ask a question. Dr. Daly. Yeah, thanks very much. It's really helpful to see this early data, and thanks very much, Dr. Sue, for that presentation. This this is more of a comment, um, um, and then Dr. Sue, jump in if you have anything to add. But but I would just say that um, for the for the two um, cases that you mentioned, where 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 ind individuals had died following vaccination, I would just stress a couple points. First is, is, is that these are going to be investigated really really carefully by VAERS. I'm, I'm sure of that. And then the second is to highlight that in, um, <clears throat> um, I'll put my pediatrician on hat, hat on here for a second to say, you know, these are children with special health care needs. And, you know, they're, they're medically quite fragile and they're at greatly increased risk of, um, of respiratory disease. And if they get respiratory disease, it's often quite severe. Um, and um, so what that does is that also puts them at significantly increased risk of um, severe outcomes if they develop COVID. And so I'm sure if someone's listening, they may be concerned by these reports, but I would just reiterate that, you know, these will be investigated, you know, carefully and closely and that these are children who are sort of medically fragile at a, at a baseline and, and are likely to have increased risk from COVID as well. Um, doc, Dr. Sue, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and see if you agree with that assessment. Um, oh, absolutely, Dr. Daly. I think uh, those are very, very uh, good observations. I really can't add to that. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? I don't see any hands raised, so we'll move. Oh, I don't see any hands raised, so I think we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, to an update on the Omicron variant uh, from Dr. Heather Scobie. And thank you again, Dr. Sue. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you very much. Thanks. Next slide. On, a, on November 24, 2021, a new variant of SARS-CoV-2 B11529 was reported to the World Health Organization. This new variant was first detected in specimens collected on November 11th in Botswana and on November 14th in South Africa. B11529 was classified as a variant of concern named Omicron by WHO on November 26th and by the U.S. SARS-CoV-2 Interagency Group, or SIG, on November 30th. On December 1st, the first case of Omicron was confirmed in the U.S. Next slide. Omicron was classified as a variant of concern based on its detection in multiple countries, including in people with no travel history, its potential increased transmissibility, and the presence of a large number of mutations in the spike gene, including 15 mutations in the receptor binding domain, as shown in the picture on the right. These mutations may lead to reduction in the efficacy of some antibody treatments, and a reduction in neutralization by sera from vaccinated or convalescent individuals. Next slide. In terms of what we currently know about Omicron, it's likely to be more transmissible than the original SARS-CoV-2, and it's likely that vaccinated people with breakthrough infection or people without symptoms can spread the virus to others. However, more data are needed to know if Omicron causes more severe disease or death than um, 
infection with other known variants. Vaccines are expected to protect against severe illness, hospitalization, and death. However, breakthrough infections in people who are fully vaccinated are expected to occur. Scientists are still working to determine how well existing treatments for COVID-19 work, but some treatments are likely to still to likely to be less effective. Next slide. This graph from the United Kingdom shows the cumulative number of cases by viral lineage in different colors versus the number of days since introduction. The relative slopes of the lines reflect the different growth rates of the different variants. The Delta variant in purple in one of its sublineages, AY4.2 in red, had higher growth rates than other variants, which resulted in Delta success in dominating the viral landscape. What you can see is that Omicron, the green line, has an even steeper slope than Delta, with its calculated growth rate of 0.35 per day or an inferred doubling time of every two days. Omicron is predicted to surpass Delta by mid-December in the United Kingdom. Next slide. South Africa has documented Omicron spread with a doubling time of every 3.4 days in a province with high population immunity. The country has also shown an increased risk of reinfection associated with Omicron. In Norway, they documented a large Christmas party outbreak with an attack rate of over 70%, where most of the people infected were vaccinated with two mRNA doses. There were no hospitalizations associated with the outbreak. Next slide. This U.S. map shows the jurisdictions reporting at least one Omicron variant case in a darker shade of green. As of yesterday, 37 U.S. jurisdictions had reported an Omicron case. Next slide. Details of early Omicron cases were recently reported in the MMWR by CDC co-authors. As of December 8th in the United States, 43 cases with full case details had been identified in 22 states. 33% of cases had international travel history. Others had exposure to domestic travel, large public events, and household transmission. 79% of cases were fully vaccinated. Overall, 32% had a booster dose, but a portion of these had recently received their additional dose within 14 days before symptom onset. A limited number of initial Omicron case, a limitation of initial Omicron case descriptions is that people with recent international travel or participation in large public events might be more likely to be vaccinated. Finally, 14% of cases were previously infected. Next slide. As part of the response to Omicron, CDC is monitoring genomic surveillance and vaccine breakthrough. CDC works with partners on scientific experiments to answer important questions about the Omicron variant and also monitors vaccine administration and vaccine effectiveness. CDC continues to support state, local, tribal, and territorial health departments in their responses. And CDC continues to update recommendations related to travel, prevention strategies, and holiday activities based on the most recent evidence. Next slide. We have a multifaceted genomic surveillance system for analyzing SARS-CoV-2 variants circulating in the United States. This includes the National SARS-CoV-2 Strain Surveillance. CDC supported contracts with several commercial diagnostic laboratories. And finally, Sequences that partners randomly sampled, deposited, and tagged in public repositories, such as GISAID and NCBI. CDC estimates that if the, a variant is circulating at 0.1% frequency, there is a greater than 99% chance that it will be detected in the national genomic surveillance. To further increase the surveillance sensitivity, enhanced genomic surveillance for S gene target failure or SGTF was conducted during November 28th to December 10th, 2021. This consisted of rapid sequencing for SGTF by T 
PCR-based diagnostic tests, which were then referred for further confirmation by genomic sequencing. This approach was successful at identifying many of the early Omicron cases. We also expanded voluntary airport-based genomic surveillance programs in Atlanta, New York City, Newark, and San Francisco. Next slide. These are our latest national nowcast projections of the proportions of circulating SARS-CoV-2 variants from CDC's COVID data tracker. The stacked bars show the observed historic estimates and the most recent nowcast, nowcast projections for the commonly sequenced SARS-CoV-2 lineages in the U.S. by week of specimen collection. The Delta variants of concern depicted in different orange shades had maintained its dominance at 98% to 99% since August and over 50% since late June. Omicron was first detected in specimens collected during the week ending November 27th, resulting in a less than 0.1% proportion during that week. The now cast projections for Omicron increased to 0.4% for the week ending December 4th, and 2.9% for the week ending December 11th. Delta is now 96.7%. Next slide. Only three weeks after Omicron was first reported to the, U to the WHO, preliminary results have been po posted from 15 lab neutralization studies of vaccine era using both pseudoviruses and live viruses. All studies show large reductions in neutralization of Omicron viruses of 15 to 127 fold compared with uh, wild type viruses. And one study showed an 11 fold reduction compared with Delta, which is known to be further reduced compared to wild type. The actual reduction may be underestimated because Omicron neutralization was below the limit of assay detection for most individuals who received two doses of mRNA or one dose of the Janssen vaccines. And these values had to be imputed or ignored to calculate a fold reduction. I'll note that the impact of the Omicron variant on neutralization with vaccine serum is greater than previously reported with any other variant, including the beta variant, which had previously um, the, had the greatest observed impact. In more positive news, Neutralization of Omicron was above the, limited, the limit of detection in many vaccinated people who had either received a booster dose or vaccinated people that had been previously infected. We note that because of the limits of detection in these types of assays, it's difficult to evaluate whether people had the minimal level of antibodies thought to be needed to protect against severe disease. T cell response also appears to be largely preserved against Omicron, with the exception of a few HLA types. Next slide. Within the last few days, preliminary results posted from South Africa have observed 70% protection for Pfizer vaccine against COVID-19 hospitalization and 33% protection against infection during uh, the current Omicron wave. This is reduced compared with the Delta variant, which had 93% protection against hospitalization and 80% protection against infection. Booster vaccination was not evaluated in the study. The authors also noted that the risk of hospital admissions among with COVID-19 was 29% lower for the Omicron variant compared with the ancestral lineage after adjusting for vaccination status. Next slide. This is a graph of Pfizer vaccine effectiveness, or V versus time since vaccination for two and three vaccine doses in the United Kingdom. The Delta variant is shown with black squares and the Omicron variant is shown with gray circles. The study investigators observed decreased protection against Omicron with increasing time since re receipt of the second dose and 35% uh, VE against infection observed for Omicron versus 64% for Delta at 25 plus weeks. Two weeks after the Pfizer booster dose, VE against hospitalization 
increased to 76% against Omicron compared with 73% for Delta. Next slide. The prevention strategies we have to slow the spread of, Omicron variant, of the Omicron variant in the U.S. include vaccination, which is recommended for everyone aged five years and older, and booster doses, which are recommended for all persons aged 18 years and older. Other prevention strategies include increased use of masking, improved ventilation, wider and more frequent testing, including self-testing, and adherence to guidance on quarantine and isolation. Next slide. Vaccine manufacturers are conducting booster studies of current vaccines and second generation vaccines against the Omicron variant. Moderna is testing a higher dosage of their existing vaccine against the Omicron variant. They're also evaluating two multivalent vaccines for the beta and delta variants against Omicron and developing an Omicron-specific vaccine. Pfizer is evaluating alpha, beta, and delta boosters against Omicron, as well as developing an Omicron-specific vaccine. No Omicron-specific booster vaccine study results have been shared to date. Next slide. In summary, the currently authorized vaccines work against known variants. Given the increased risks related to the Delta and Omicron variants, it is important to increase uptake of primary vaccination and booster doses in all eligible populations. CDC is closely monitoring real-world vaccine effectiveness and breakthrough infections using multiple methods, populations, and outcomes. CDC continues to monitor emerging variants, including their prevalence and impact on disease incidence, severity, and vaccine breakthrough. The ACIP will continue to review evidence submitted for boosters in any next generation vaccines to address evidence of diminished VE related to variants or waning immunity. Finally, this is a changing landscape and CDC will communicate promptly about emerging evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scobie. Are there any questions from members, liaisons on the line? Dr. Freihofer? Uh, thank you so much, Sandra Freihofer, uh, American Medical Association. Thank you so much for that update. Uh, certainly is timely. Um, and thank you for the more detailed information about the Pfizer vaccine. But do you have any specifics about how Moderna and how Janssen um, react against uh, Omicron and their, their VE? So this, these are still very early days. Um, we have a nice study completed by Moderna, um, a, a laboratory assay, uh, the neutralization um, assay, um, which is showing that uh, the booster doses appear to protect um, well, or at least with less of a defect um, against Omicron but we still need um, VE data for the other uh, U.S. authorized vaccines. Can you, do you have any details about this NIH study that, that, that's been um, sort of teased in the news? Sorry, I don't. I, we meet with them um, as a group tomorrow, so we might have more details in the future. Thank you. Dr. Paling? I want to say thank you for sharing this very important and timely information. I wanted to um, ask for a clarification um, about boosters because I believe they're recommended for everybody 16 and older and wanted to verify that's correct. Thank you. Dr. Oliver, do you want yep. to clarify? I just want to, what's the question? <laughs> But yeah, boosters um, are, would, yeah, people 16 so and over are boosters, eligible for boosters. Yeah. There yeah, is a I May recommendation. There was a typo in a slide, and I wanted to clarify for everybody it's 16 and older. Thanks for that correction. I'll be sure to fix it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Dr. Cotton? I was wondering, given the need for boosters um, for uh, better protection against Omicron. I'm wondering if we might need to make a recommendation for boosters for immunocompromised 
uh, that would happen sooner than six months after their third dose of mRNA vaccine. Do you have any thoughts about that? I know it's very early. Um, I haven't looked to um, this question in terms of, you know, some of the neutralization studies do evaluate specific populations. I'm not sure if these early, this early batch of studies looked into that question, so I don't know that I can comment right now. Yeah, and this is Thank this you. Is Dr. I Oliver. Oh, just going to say, we, we look forward to kind of following up data and um, can, can update as needed. Thank you. Dr. Cotton, is there anything else? Nope, that's it. I would, I would just encourage the ACIP to think about perhaps earlier booster doses, because I think um, we're seeing with Omicron that neutralization is not very good after two doses, and it's better with boosters, and especially for vulnerable immunocompromised patients that represent approximately 3% of the U.S. population, they may be uh, much more vulnerable to Omicron in the next few months. Thank you. Dr. Dries? Um, I basically had the same question as Dr. Cotton, except I would just uh, emphasize that we're getting that question not only from the immunocompromised persons, but from the general population who, you know, who got their second dose less than six months ago, and they are very interested in getting boosted um, because of Omicron. So thank you. Thank you. I'm also getting it for 12 to 15-year-olds. <laughs> Dr. Maldonado? Yeah, um, I know this is a question. No, you're, we're talking about vaccines here, but um, we're hearing reports from South Africa, for example, from a large health center, a health system study, that children are less likely to um, um, have Omicron disease, uh, have transmission from Omicron, but are more likely to be hospitalized if they're infected. Do you have any information about that study? Study is um, referenced on one of my slides, the um, the preliminary results um, slide. Um, I heard that that uh, publication was supposed to come out in the New England Journal of Medicine um, either yesterday or today, but I haven't seen it. The presentations that we've seen, um, and they also have a booklet about the study, um, cite 20% increased risk in younger children, I believe. I mean, they say in children, but what I see from the graphs is it looks like younger children or, or higher. Um, and it may be related. Yeah, I, 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 there's no, there were no 95% confidence intervals in the estimates. So 20%, um, I, was, I was hesitant to talk about that here today, but that is a result they cite. Um, there's just not a lot of um, methodologic detail or um, um, information about uh, the confidence in those estimates. Thanks. Thanks. Just a follow-up. I'm sorry. Maybe I didn't um, make it clear. So one of the concerns I had is, again, we saw the same top-line data, but um, the concern was also that they mentioned a 50% increased risk of hospitalization with infection, but then there was some comment about, but some of these were incidental infections. So I didn't know if they meant the 50% included incidental or it was separate from incidental infections and in children being hospitalized for other reasons. I, I share your same concern about not having enough information, which is why I chose to not include it in the slides. Um, and I think that that detail would be important to clarify. Um, these kinds of um, reports about um, severity in children, um, you know, tend to get people very um, excited or um, upset. So I, I do think it's something to watch closely, and hopefully their publication will be out in the next day or so, and we'll, we'll know better. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gluckman? Yeah, uh, two things. I, 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 do we know if there's a clinical trial with a third uh, shot being given uh, uh, shortly after the second shot, you know, you know, within a month or two or at some interval, it's not six months to address this issue of when does a third shot maybe, uh, when is the third shot maybe needed? It seems like a clinical trial would be useful in that setting. And then I think that we should have some information uh, within maybe three or four months about the uh, uh, effectiveness of an Omicron booster uh, but I think if we just reflect back to our prior discussions about who needs to be boosted, 
I think we need to be prepared for the fact that that uh, people who have a third uh, shot may be um, uh, having waning immunity to Omicron uh, uh, as time goes on a little bit and need to be prepared for uh, another set of booster shots uh, at some point in, you know, before a year, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be six months after the third shot, but there's going to be some diligence need to be um, paid to that issue. Thank you. Um, Dr. Scobie, is there anything else you want to comment on? I think um, Dr. Oliver and the ACIP team may have um, the best information about um, clinical trials that they're aware of. I don't know if they want to comment. Yeah, thanks. This is Dr. Oliver. We are not um, aware of any clinical trials that are specifically looking to address that. Um, we can, you know, follow kind of global real-world VE data, and we we'll, are happy to to review and bring to ACIP what what is available. But we're not aware of of specific manufacturer conducted clinical trials uh, to evaluate that. Dr. Fink. Hi. So just. Um, there are a couple of clinical trials that have, have been conducted already looking at booster dose intervals shorter than, than six months for mRNA vaccines, and these have been published. One is the NIH uh, mix and match uh, trial, um, and the second one is the, the COM-COVE trial uh, that was conducted in, in the UK. Uh, those trials, of course, evaluate the safety and immunogenicity of a, a booster dose um, and included intervals shorter than, than six months, but they, they don't really speak to the need uh, for a booster dose uh, at those uh, decreased intervals. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Don't see any additional hands raised, and I recognize we are over time. So, I um, just want to take a moment to express my sincere gratitude to the um, to my ACIP and my CDC colleagues today for your time and your knowledge and your uh, commitment to struggle through these issues uh, as individuals, uh, and I have struggled mightily, and as a group. Um, many of us haven't had a break since the pandemic started. I think we originally thought it was going to be a sprint, and it's turned out to be a marathon. So. Um, you know, it feels like right now where we are one year later, uh, I thought things were going to get easier for the committee, and it, it continues to feel like the deliberations are getting harder and more complex. So Dr. Wharton and I just want to um, express our thanks again and hope that our committee, our CDC team members, and our federal partners and our liaisons all have an opportunity to rest and recharge during this holiday season. So thank you again for um, all of the work that's been done over the past year. Uh, we are, I am calling this the last meeting of 2021. I, <laughs> I will not be jinxed by that. Uh, is there any other business or any objections to adjourning today's meeting? Okay, hearing none, today's ACIP meeting is now adjourned and we look forward to seeing everybody in 2022. Enjoy the holidays, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Excellent.